is up, everybody? It's the Air Aid Lord. I am back in the conference room mode. I guess my voice sounds like I'm in hell. Thank you very much. Um, this is the Writer's Block, Episode 9. Um, we'll be giving you an explanation as to why the uh, quality is like this. But uh, as always, I'm Chris LaDuke, the Air Aid Lord, and with me is my co-host, the man who likes to wrap snakes around his neck and walk around the house with them. Ladies and gentlemen, What's P-Dog right. is here. Yeah, I, I finally I do. I, personally, I've never experienced myself doing this, but I guess I guess that's Oh, I have evidence. So anyway, move on, move on. We do have, as you can see, you're looking at the dog and orb at this point in time because uh, we we've kind of figured out a different regime as to how we're going to go about recording these. If we're doing something that requires a lot of like web page changing, like if we're going from face cam to different web pages to different like uh, documents. We'll do the webcam type stuff, or if we're doing something like visually that's important. However, if we're doing something just as general as like, if we're doing something just as general as just something like this where we don't really have anything else planned, then, then you know, then we'll just do it audio wise. Because I mean, it's, it's a bit easier to like get up than it is. Well, oh, not in that way, but it's easier to get it online to be a better way to yeah, put it. Yeah, basically, yeah. If Pete records it, he has to send the entire XSplit file to me, which takes a while. And he can't upload it, really. I mean, I upload all the episodes on my channel, so it's not like he could upload it. And his internet isn't, you know, the greatest and stuff. So, you know, this is how we've done all the episodes so far, me being in charge with the, with the, um, with the files and such. And I basically upload them. So we figured for this episode we just go back to the you know audio and stuff. Um, excuse me, I'm just putting my mic on a chair, but uh, but yeah, so we're going back to the old uh, the old style. Um, I apologize if my voice doesn't sound very pleasing, but it's the best we can do. Um, the way I get my voice to sound really good is with the Elgato, and I chose a different film setting, so I can't really do that at the moment. So, um, yeah, no, that's all right. Okay, uh, so. The la last episode, we talked about dialogue and how you to make your character interaction with certain, you know, and their character interactions believable. And now we're going to be talking about, like, the opposite end of the spectrum whenever no one's really speaking and whenever more is your eyes telling the story than your ears, pretty much. And so, we're going to be talking about cinematography, about setting, about how to like how to set a scene. I know it's kind of a cliche saying, but it's how to set a scene, to be honest. And so, basically, we're going to be trying out uh, differences, as always, differences between books and movies. Uh, and then, in addition to that, we're also going to be like talking about just general pointers if you're making either a screenplay or a novel, and you want to excel better at your setting. I'll say. Yes. So. Basically, generally, setting is the means by which you present your story. It's, I remember reading, um, a book that I have, um, and basically the guy said it was, um, it was like how to, how to write a novel for, it was like one of those idiots guides, you know, the idiots guides to doing stuff. So it was like the oh, idiots yeah. guide to writing a book. Like I saw it in the bookstore. And it was when I was working on my first book, and I said, why not just, you know, try it out and see what the guy has to say. One of the things he said was that setting is one of the most important things in your whole book because, as you know, from a novel perspective, because it's you as the writer have to describe the world to your audience. And this is almost like description and setting combined because basically – if you're starting off a book, you know, if it has one of those instances where it starts with dialogue, most of the time you're explaining the scenery. Somewhere in the first chapter, you're explaining to your viewers what is in the, you know, what's in the view. You know, what does the character see? Where are they? You know, how do you describe where they are? Is it a clean setting? Is it a dirty setting? Is it really, is it a depressing atmosphere or is it an uplifting atmosphere? And how you write and how you describe it with, you know, different adjectives and verbs really can set a different tone for your book and can lead into the different parts that we were talking about in previous episodes, like characters and the dialogue and um, et cetera, et cetera. So setting is very important. And, you know, the guy in that book said that setting is the most important thing in a book. Um, 
I don't know if I'd agree with that. Maybe I'll ask Pete. Do you agree with that? If setting is the most meaningful? Yeah, uh, it's definitely a big component, but I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't say that it's like the bet. Like you know, if you don't have setting, you don't have a book. Like I, get, I still, I still know good stories where it's literally just two people talking and that's about it, or like a good soliloquy or whatever. It's almost like a story in and of itself, which doesn't have like any setting to it. I would say. Huh. That's my take on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are some circumstances, like he just said, like a soliloquy where the setting maybe isn't needed. There are some stories that are beautifully crafted where the setting where you don't really go into that great a detail. But in some like the audience, in my opinion, needs to know to some degree what where where the characters are and what's happening. And recently, you know. We'll talk about this at, at the end. Usually our segment at the end is to talk about what we're currently doing with our writing. But basically, with me, I'm, act, I'm revising my first book for the final time. This is like the final revision before I go off to college. I'll have a final product. I'm about halfway through the book, and I'm on the scene where the characters Noah and Alex and Jack, they go to Crimson for the first time. And especially the first couple of intro chapters, like the chapters where Noah is first introduced to the science fiction world, it was kind of difficult for me to describe everything that he saw because it was all fictional. It was all new. Like, I didn't know if there was a set way to do something. Like, how do I describe the aliens? You know, how do I describe the armor? How do I describe the environment? You know, he's on a snow planet. You know, now he's in this high-tech city. You know, how do I describe the city that he's in? Do I describe the city in terms of, like, a city like New York City? Or do I try to go more kind of alien futuristic with terms that people might not know like it's very difficult especially for like fantasy science fiction writing to get an equilibrium between um the description you give for an area and especially you know when you're making you know if this is i'm talking from a fiction perspective um pete can give you more of an understanding from maybe a script like you know maybe non-fiction but in terms of the fiction that I've written, I, as I said, I often find it hard to get an accurate setting description for the, um, for the characters from what they see, because my book is first person. So it would almost seem weird for Noah to have this super descriptive knowledge, like, oh, this was the turbine that generated the power that did this. Like, like I don't want to go into, like, super, super detail about everything around him, like, if I can find that nice equilibrium between being descriptive enough so that the audience can get a picture in their mind, that's always what you want to do with setting. The general rule of setting is to paint a picture for the viewer, basically. So if they can't, if you, if, 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 if the reader can't do that, then they might be confused for the rest of your book and you might have lost them. So, I think in that regard, maybe setting's not the most critical thing to a book, but it's definitely one of the most important factors. And I know for fiction writing, it can be difficult. So, um, so Pete, in some of the scripts that you've written, like The Park Bench and some of the other things that I have that we've read together and you've sent me in the past, what were some of the things you came across when you were trying to do the setting for particular nonfiction areas? Well, I think that there's three things I keep in mind. Like, 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 I have three different sets, like, type, like, script types, uh, whenever I have to, like, well, I, I have three, you know, and, and I can think of an additional one, which I haven't done yet, where, uh, set is kind of an interesting thing to think about, and they've got different scenarios for it. And so, for example, something like, um, for, like, let, let's take it, let's take it bit by bit, okay? So, I've done screenplays for, like, local events, like churches or schools or whatnot. And so for stuff like that, you kind of have to like work with your resources and like um, and like try and imagine stuff. And so that means that you have to like like if like if you don't have a budget or anything, if you're not going to make this like a big mainstream thing, then you just gonna have to roll with the punches and take what you're given. And so you would have to use stuff like, for example, in our drama department in school, we have like rostra and we have like. Stuff that previous pupils have had, like painted stuff or like um, props and costumes and stuff. And so, in terms of set, general set, then there isn't really much to go with apart from like maybe a table, a few chairs, some rostra, you know, whatever. And then pretty much props and costume have to kind of like tell the significant details of different characters. And so, in something like that, you can't really just go all out and say, "Oh, we're going to be in a spacing, uh, you know, in the space place, and we're going to be like." Martians and stuff, because you kind of have to like work with what you're given, unless you can really make your audience imagine that something like that really isn't going to happen. But that's more of like a drama sense than it is of an actual screenplay. 
screenplay since some of the stuff that I've done, um, the two things that I've done was, like you said, the part bench. And for that, I was trying to think in a bit more like in the future, like if I was to actually take this and try and give it to people. I, I had to think of realistic stuff because it was a realistic tale. It wasn't like a sci-fi thing, like what Chris was doing for his stuff. So for mine, I actually had to make everything quite practical. And sometimes in your stage directions and set descriptions, you have to kind of even plot out all like the smallest details. So you have to have stuff like, oh, um, you know, there's one crooked chair in the in the corner. Like if you really want to emphasize that in terms of like camera work or whatever, then you have to always make that clear in your set in your screenplay. If you want to emphasize something in your screenplay, make it clear. You know, like, don't just say, oh, there's a few stuff here and there and the everywhere, or else, you know, the, the director, whoever you're going to pass it to, you won't know what you want to emphasize on. Whereas if you specifically emphasize something, or even just blatantly say to the person, emphasize on the rocking chair in the corner or something like that, then they'll obviously know what they're doing. And so that could be good if you want to, like, tell a, tell a scene using cinematography, which I'll get to you in later on this episode. So cinematography is another big thing. That's a good example. So I have a question then. The scene that you set up with the chair in the drama sense how would someone, if I were to write a book, like a fi- not, you know, a fictional book, and I had a chair that was in the corner of a room that I wanted to emphasize to the reader because it's important for something maybe that happens or whatever, you know, how would that how would that work? Would when I when I write, do I basically do another paragraph and basically say? You know, there was a peculiar chair in the corner that was, ca- you know, that was shaded by well, the shadows. Well, do you mean in terms of just writing in your screenplay, like just John Dine stuff? Yeah, like, like, how, like, yeah, like written it, words. It, you, yeah. wouldn't go, you wouldn't go full on paragraph. You wouldn't go all, you know, author like. You would pretty much John Dine like keynotes, like maybe like like rocking chair, crooked, you know, um, like stained or stained a bit, you know, emphasis, like something like that. It's a very key word. Like, boom, 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 boom. You're not gonna like try and say, oh, I really. You know, really, there was something very suspicious about this rocking chair that caught in the corner of my eye. Like, you're not going to say anything like that because well, you're not writing a novel. Writing is a that, but, what, but my question was, if you were to write a novel about what you just said, would you use that? Would you basically... Yeah, yeah, you'd do something like that. Yeah. But yeah, for play, you write it in shorthand, and then in novel form, if you really want to emphasize it, then obviously, talk to Kristen, talk to me. But, I mean, if you were going to, if you were to convert it, then you would probably put a lot more emphasis in it and something like that. But depending on how important it is, would depend on how many words you're actually going to write for it. So that's just, that's my take on it. But yeah, for like a screenplay, that's another interesting point, even if it was accidental, yeah. If you want to describe something for something like that, it's like short, it's like short notes. So maybe there actually are some codes. And the funny, funny enough, a video word in webcam, I could have actually shown you this. There actually is a video. Yeah. <laughs> there are a load of like codes you can do where shorthand isn't even quick enough and you actually have like letters, literally. And so you would have like D for day, N for night. You know, like you do like the 24 hour clock, like this is 500 hours. You know, uh, like, like, day, you know, outside military camp, that would be like, you know, like, shot outside, military camp, medium shot, you know, want to get a bit of, like, the field in the background, want to get some marching soldiers in the front, but not emphasizing too much. But you would write that all in shorthand. So you might say something like, medium shot, soldiers, you know, uh, soldiers, quite small, you know, like, just, just, just stuff like that down, and it's very quick to notice. And then you're not wasting time, you know, describing a load of stuff when really, People like directors, unless you're directing it yourself, in which case you know what you want to write about. But if you're passing it on to the rest of your team, if you have it shorthand, then it'll be more general for them, and they can, you know, they can improvise or interpret things in the way they want to. And for all you know, they can come up with something quite magical that you didn't even think about beforehand. And so that's why it's quite good to keep it brief. But if you really want to emphasize something, write down more key words about it. And if you are working with a team, then make sure they know that you want to emphasize that. And so your camera people or your lighting crew or your sound people. They know what to emphasize on specifically. And so that's that's the second part. The third one is a very rare one, and it's something that machinima partners would work with or machinima directors. And that's what like what your resources give you, but in a video game sense or in a like virtual sense. And so say like like this would come in my union series, and so basically I own I can only work with what Halo has given me. So different maps, I can't create my own map in Halo. It's not it's not like in there's two different categories. If you're doing something like on the like in the like in the like in the um in the oh what do you call it? Uh you oh this the the Steam Source Engine or the Valve Source Engine where you can create your own maps and stuff and people have done that to tell their own stories, you know, it's pretty ridiculous. However, if you're working with something like on console, like like on Halo Reach or whatever, then you can only work with what the maps give you. And so you just have to kind of work everything around it. And so for something like that you shouldn't emphasize much on set unless it's something that, you know, Halo players would be familiar yeah. with. Or if you didn't game, the like Call of Duty, 
like Borderlands, mm-hmm. like Far Cry. It's like kind Final of funny because we just watched, you know, the newest RB and the Chief. And something typical that John Graham, who made RB and the Chief, does is he takes camera shots of things that are in the Halo matches. Like, for instance, the episode we just watched, Event Horizon, towards the end, you know, without spoiling anything, there's a shot. You you remember this, Pete, the building shot with the fl- the the falling, like, fiery rocks, like the molten rocks falling off that building? Like, he'll take, like, scenery that's created by the game developers, and he'll take shots of that in different positions to give a feel for the episode. And that's and he he does this for all, a whole bunch of different episodes. Like, there was one episode where it shows a faucet dripping, and we have, like, a running joke up. Pete and I, when we watch, it's always like, oh, it's the John Graham, you know, cinematography shot to start the episode. Because he typically, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, we've caught, we've caught on to it. It's pretty much every episode, you know, he usually starts with, not all the time, but he usually starts or at some point in the episode has a shot of something either in the game or in real life that's a still image of something that's like moving just, just there. And it's to, it's to emphasize something or it's to be maybe, Imagery, maybe for imagery sense, perhaps for um, something like a machinima, but uh, it's something typical that he does, and uh, it works. It definitely works because you know it keeps you guessing, it makes you ponder to yourself as you're watching this shot about what's going to happen or what has happened, and uh, it's a nice break. Always, that's something for novel writing, which I'll talk about a little bit. That when you write a book, especially fiction, the se- the, the description of the setting can be very useful as a pause for for the dialogue or other things. Like, think about what we said in the last episode about dialogue, where basically the dialogue can be a break from the setting, just like the description. Like, I'm not going to write, you know, five paragraphs of, you know, they went here into this, and then this place looked like this, and then this place looked like this, and blah, 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 blah. The dialogue changes it up by having conversations so it keeps the book at a good pace. And it keeps it interesting. Like, you'll see when you go to a bookstore, on the back cover of the book, when they review the books, you'll sometimes see in quotations, the book is very fast-paced, very nice. When they say fast-paced, it means it's moving from the action. Like, it wouldn't be a slow-paced book where it's, you know, pages of description, and then something happens, and then pages of description, and then something happens. Like, fast-paced is, you know, action, action, a little description, action. Like, it's, it's more of a quicker, quicker process of you reading the book and things happening. So, um, basically, you know, you, you can tackle it what, however you want. I'll say that a lot of the books that have been successful in the past, like, you know, Harry Potter and Twilight and stuff like that, those books were generally fast-paced because it's something that it keeps the audience on their toes, I believe. It keeps them guessing. It keeps them wanting to know more. And the setting and how you describe it, whether it's dark, good, bad, and how that, how that matches up to the other aspects of your book, is something that will keep the reader guessing and keep the reader going through your book, because that's your ultimate goal, to want the reader to stick through the whole course of whatever you've written. So, you know, whether it's a book or a screenplay or whatever. So that's your ultimate goal, and that's that's really how the setting can fit that for you, and just and how the other components can as well. So, Yeah, so, so um, I guess yeah. the fourth one I was going to talk about actually goes quite extensive, and that's CGI. Pretty much, where you see you see all the films like you see, you know, Avatar is obviously the biggest offender. Of 3D. This. Other films do this a lot, like um, Pacific Rim does it a lot. The Transformers movies, even stuff like Batman in some cases does stuff like this. But it's like CGI sense where it's like, like Avatar is probably the biggest offender where you just look down and you're like, this is not believable. Like obviously this is CGI. Like you can tell right off the get go this isn't like this isn't like an attempted set. This is just all computer generated stuff, and so. For stuff like that, it is kind of like a hair or miss. On the positive side, you can do anything with CGI, pretty much. Where you can pretty much just... You can just go ham. You can make whatever you want if you have a good team behind it. And so, you, you know, second... So, something like The Orb, if you were to do something with CGI, anything that you say in the book can pretty much be, be made to life. It can pretty much be put to life through CGI. But on the negative side, because it doesn't look very naturalistic, then a lot of people kind of turned away from it. Because it's like, oh, it looks kind of, you know plasmatic and it looks a bit like it just doesn't look real and it's not to my teching because people like realistic stuff because they can relate to it whereas something like that it's just like uh like you kind of turned away from it quite a number of times so would you say there are any fantasy sorry this, uh, this isn't a q and a i'm just curious but uh would you say there are films that use cgi that do it well so it's more believable like 
if there was to um, be, if there was to be a movie based on the orb, obviously I don't want it to be cheesy CGI because the, the city of Crimson, there's flying ships, and I don't think there are any flying ships in existence in our world unless the government's working on them. But basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all that UFO shit. But basically, if you want to film a scene with flying ships and stuff, you know those don't exist. You're gonna have to make. Some, somehow computer generate it. So, you know, is there a way to do it, you know, spot on, or is there a, is there a bright way of doing it, perhaps, you know? That's well, the I question. think there's some stuff in, like... No, no, I know you're going to be, like, gnashy TV this, but I think some stuff in, like, Harry Potter is quite done, done quite well in CJ, because they, they put, like, humanistic stuff, and they just make... It. Like, for example, the candles floating, like, in the diner, or whatever the heck it is, you know, in the main big room, you know, whenever the candles float, it's such a simple change, but it looks very natural, because, and I'm pretty sure that that's all done, like, the, the, the candles are done with CGI, it's not, like, on the strings. And so, stuff like that, like, it just looks very, like, it looks kind of natural and it kind of fits with it. And so I think if you put something that's natural normally, and then just, you know, add a little twist to it. So, for example, your cars, you wouldn't just make them all plasmatic and, you know, like, you know, like, elect- electrodes coming out of them and stuff. No, you'd make it, like, a natural car, but just make it fly, like, no wheels, and just have a bit of, like, a hovering type stuff. Like, you've probably seen, uh, Photoshop photos of, like, like, cars and whatnot, you know, being turned into hover mobiles and whatnot. But, like, for stuff like that, like, it kind of works. And so whenever you see stuff that's a bit more, like, even stuff like, like, the, like, the picture frames that move a bit in, like, in Harry Potter, like, that stuff doesn't look that bad, because it's kind of, like, it's already like man-made stuff but they've just added a little twist to it whereas if you have killer robots going through new york or if you have crazy blue people that are like coming there like living like big flipping green tree places like tundra type areas you know then it just doesn't look very good because you don't really recognize it and so sure the era of unfamiliarity is all well and good but then whenever you get to a point where you're like i don't understand a single thing of what's going on it's almost like the, the visual equivalent of reading a sci-fi book and not understanding what the heck all the jargon's all about. That's what I would pretty, probably, pretty much be the equivalent to. If you look at a film and see just a load of stuff, just, like, it hurts your eyes while looking at it because you're like, there's so much stuff going on and the CGI is just very ugly. I have no idea what's going on, you know, then... Yeah. What's a good it, example of a film that just goes way over the top with CGI? I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, oh, um, Battleships. By far, battle. Oh trip. my god! I think my Michael dad, Bay, of course. My dad that, all, that ruined it, honestly. Like Rihanna was bad enough, but that film, <laughs> the that film was just horrific. Bad. No, you know what? My dad's one critique. Sorry, I don't want to go too off topic, but my dad's one. My biggest, my dad's biggest critique of Battleship. Did you watch Battleship, by the way? Yeah, I did. Okay. Do you know how the end of the movie they they use? Oh, spoilers. All right, yeah, spoiler alert. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Pete. As always, we're spoiling in the rice plug, you know, it's our trademark, but go on. Yeah, yeah, thanks. But, um, you know, at the end when they resurrect the Pearl Harbor boat and all the old guys are on the boat and stuff and yeah. whatnot, my dad's biggest pet peeve was he's like, there's no fucking way they would get that old Pearl Harbor ship to work. He's like, those things aren't meant to even move. He's like, they're out of commission just for, like, for show, like, there's no fucking way that they would even work. Like, my dad was flabbergasted. He, <laughs> he said he turned off the TV right at that scene. And it was just, oh, my God. Like, like of course, Michael Bay going cheesy. Like, he's kind of known, like, like Michael Bay has become the running gag of, oh, you know, excessive explosions and, you know, like, an insane shit After going the on. Transformers, it was just like, the Transformers is so over the top. Because he's trying to be all, oh, look how natural we are. And he just keeps and- making them. Oh, my God. <laughs> Doesn't he have one that's quite recent that was flipping just like that? I don't know. He he's made like four fucking Transformers movies. It's only because people want to see that dumb broad in it. Every that's I, I swear that's the biggest reason people want to see that movie. And I could be wrong. Maybe it's the, the explosions and sound effects and shit. People just want to sh- see shit blow up. Maybe I don't know. But if that's the case, go play a video game. But <laughs> yeah, like I said, that's that's a way, that's a version of CGI that's just really ugly to the eyes, and it's just like. Like, you can tell nothing in that movie is actual, is actually real. And everything they're doing is behind a green screen. And everything they're doing is just, like, everything's fake. Like, the guns are fake. Like, flipping every, everything's just fake all over the place. So, <laughs> anyway. Um, well, 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 no, that's true. Actually, yeah, that, yeah. You know, now that you bring it up, that actually is a pretty good example of some green screen that's kind of, like, like, for example, like, like, Obviously, Port of Project 7 is supposed to be, like, you know, it's not supposed to be real at all, obviously. Like, someone stole the other, like, some guy has stolen the other guy's gaming parts. Like, that, that in itself is just um, profound. But, yeah, some of the sets and that, like, I will give them props for the limited amount of resources that they have to have such a variety of sets. But, but I mean, some of the green screen that is pretty 
bad. But I guess you can maybe excuse that because it's, you know, it's limited people. And so you don't have, but if you have like big budget of people, having so much, you know, CGI in a film just shows you've got a lot of money to fucking burn, to be honest. Yeah, so, like, like James Cameron, he fucking takes a bath in money, so he's probably just throwing it at CGI. Seriously, I mean, I just, I, I just, I mean, this might get controversial. I don't know how Pete feels about this, but he mentioned the movie Avatar. Like, I don't see what the hype is about that movie. Like, I honestly think that movie sucks. Like, seriously, like the whole concept of it is just dumb and it's just really over the top. Especially like I started laughing my ass off, especially at the final fight where. The big bad guy, you know, the general, he just keeps living. You know the scene, Pete, where, you know, he blows up the ship, and then he inhales oxygen, and he jumps in the mech, and then he jumps from the exploding ship, he jumps from the mech to the ground as the ship blows up, and then, like, he has this fight with this animal, and then even then he's still surviving. It's like, it's this, it's just so silly. And then, like, the element that they're trying to get from these alien people, like, unobtainium, like, could you have thought of a better name than that? Like, I don't... I just didn't see all the hoopla about Avatar, and like you said, it was it was all insane CGI stuff, and that was one of the big things he prided himself on. You know, look how real this looks, you know, it's, it's so great, and it's just, I don't know, I don't, I didn't agree with Avatar, and it's just, just you know, I don't know, just that's just my perspective. I don't know if Pete has any different feelings on that. I completely agree. I, I think I think Avatar is overrated. It is totally. Yeah, you know, for for being the highest grossed film of all time, I don't I don't get it. Really, it I is. Type out. Yeah, high school mo Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's grossed over like three billion dollars, like two or three billion dollars. What? What? It's not even that. Gr- oh my god! Dude. Man, I think Titanic is either second or third. Oh James Cameron flipping. He is reeling in that flipping. Yeah, he just. That's why he thinks. But that's something about James Cameron. He thinks that anything he does is like godlike. Like I made it. It's perfect. Don't touch it. I I have made money. I have successful movies. Do not touch... Because I remember that. I remember seeing an article about how one guy quit James Cameron's team because he couldn't take his shit anymore. Because any suggestion the guy made, James Cameron would say, no, we're doing it this way because I want it to be this way because I know what to do because I'm successful and shit. Like, I don't know. I mean, that goes with the ego. But I think we've gone way off topic from setting from fucking to James Cameron and Avatar. So I was just pretty much saying that CGI in those kind of movies is a bit over the yeah, top. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so that's film. So we've actually covered a lot of the corners of the of uh, writing and storytelling. You know, we've got novels. Pete told you a little bit about you know drama performances and stuff and script writing. Then we were briefly talking about you know movies and films and how that's incorporated. Uh, you know, machinimas online, which are still you know pretty kind of they were more popular in like two thousand ten, eight, nine, kind of those years, but. People still do them, but they they don't catch on because people would rather see Call of Duty gameplay than anything like that. So, but but yeah, um, can you think? Of and funny else? because if Call of Duty was made into a movie, it would have somewhat CGI, don't you think? Like you can t- like even Call of Duty itself is just like oh uh, like, oh oh my god! I really wish we had our we we were doing webcams right now because um, have you ever seen the movie uh, Fine Makarov? Did you ever see that? No. It's, I thought you were going to bring up Act of Valor, which is pretty much Call of Duty the movie. No, um, there's a there's a fan-made film. Bef- this was in early 2011, before Modern Warfare 3 came out. And everyone thought it was a trailer for Modern Warfare 3. Everyone was like, oh shit, what is this? So, it was called Find Makarov, and it was basically a real-life rendition of the events of Modern Warfare 2. It's pretty interesting. I, w- oh, I wish we could... Oh, you know what? Nah, I was gonna say that could be our pump up clip, but eh, I don't know about that. I mean, it's it's up to you, well, obviously. Well, if it, if it shows a good set, then I guess really out of it. Yeah, I'll not. I'll watch it with Pete once we're done this, just to show him and stuff. I thought it was really well done. Like it shows the events of Modern Warfare One and Two, like like actually done, like real actors acting it out and stuff. It's really well done. Like everyone thought it was the actual trailer, but these guys, these guys did it. And then Infinity Ward actually contacted them and said, we love this, make another one. They funded their next project, which they made an, a sequel called Operation Kingfish or something, which basically reveals how Price went to jail in the events of Modern Warfare 2. It actually reveals backstory, and Infinity Ward told it through their creative thing. So it was pretty cool. It was very interesting and stuff. So um, it was it was a good one. I, I enjoyed that one. But um, can you think of anything else? Well, in terms of what? Other things for setting, because we've gone through, uh, we've gone through, you know, the novel stuff, we've gone through, you know, the drama yes, stuff. It's not really that big of a, or did it 
Like, it still just kind of writes itself in a way. Like, I would also say, probably, in terms of thing about set, don't forget your five senses. You know, sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I got all those, didn't I? Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. There, there was actually a poll. You know, we can't link to this, but there was a poll I saw when I was taking my creative writing class before I graduated from high school. My creative writing class, my teacher told us that the least common sense that is used... Actually, I'll ask Pete. Guess what sense was the least commonly used? I remember you told me this, but I can't even remember. Oh, you can't remember? All. If you had to guess out of the five, which would it be? Um, uh, hearing. Sound. No. Um, uh, smell. Smell? Really? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. I guess yes. so. I guess, like, for novices, you know, they probably don't think about smell, but... I, I always put smell in mind, just, you know, because I think it's quite important as well. Like, whenever, like, the rare times I actually write novels, I, I put in yeah. smell quite a I lot. I guess you would exclude taste, but taste would only be if you're eating something. Like, it's not like, I fell to the ground and my tongue brushed against the gravel, which tasted quite like, no. Like, like gravel. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, you you're, much of it. yeah, like, you only do taste when the characters come in contact with food or drink. But, like, in terms of senses that are going on, like, in your environment, like, smell is overlooked. And it was funny, because when I was writing last night, I actually realized that, because Alex, in the scene in, in The Orb, they land at a junkyard, and one of the first things I describe is how it smells horrible. And I actually use some Earth examples to give the reader a perspective. That's actually something I've been typically doing in my writing. Noah, since Noah is new to this science fiction universe, he compares this new world to his old world. So he'll say, like, oh, this vehicle looked like a snow speeder, but with this stuff and this stuff on it. Like, it almost, because it feels more natural to you. Like, I think that's why I like my book so much, and I think people would enjoy reading it, because... It's not like many science fiction books where the main character, or if it's third person, where they assume that you know everything. Like, oh, you should know what the Gubalaba is because it's in the back of the book, and this is this alien thing, and this is this alien thing. Like, they expect you to know jargon about the whole alien world. Basically, in my book, Noah, it starts on Earth. It starts with something you're familiar with. You know, Noah going to school with friends, blah, blah, blah. So the, for the first five chapters, it's, it's like everyday life. And then it takes a dip into this world that's fictional. But Noah is experiencing it from a perspective of never having been in a world like this. So he, everything that he sees is like as if you were to go there, like if you were teleported like him, and you had to see this stuff. So that's, that's how I go about describing stuff. So I think this is a good tip for people writing fiction. If it's first person or stuff, I think first person really is the greatest way to go, just in my personal opinion. We might talk about point of view in a future writer's block episode, but... I like first person more because of all the things you can do from it focusing on a, on a single character. But I put you in the shoes of Noah, basically. You know, what would Noah feel? What would you feel if you were just thrown into some, you know, random, you know, fucking alien homeworld? And you're, it's, you're seeing all of these towers and spaceships and aliens. You know, how, what would you start with? Would you describe the atmosphere, you know, their color? You know, well, you know, what would you go for? And that's... It's difficult for me to do that sometimes. Like, I have to really think very hard sometimes to get the words to kind of flow together. But most of the time, I can get I can get a good product, and it does come out very nicely and stuff. And um, it takes practice, just as we've said with previous Writer's Block episodes. None of this stuff generally comes instantaneous. It's not like you're going to start writing and say, oh, I know the perfect way to describe this place. Like, you know, that really never happens. It's very rare, and usually... You're revising your work constantly, so that's really not going to happen that often and such. So uh, just keep that in mind when you do setting. Setting is important. If you don't give enough description about a setting, it could catch the reader off guard. Just like Pete said, in some cases it's not critical to a work, but it's still a necessary component. So, And also, like, a lot of people would change their setting. Like, very, like you just add little stuff to your setting like every once in a while. So if you ever go back and read what you said about setting, you'd be like, oh, you know, Maybe I can describe something else that happened, or maybe I have a brainstorm, you're, you're a brain whiz, you're like, whoa, I just remembered I can talk about this, this, or this, or this, you know, blah, blah, blah. So stuff like that can, like, help out as well. So just don't be afraid to, like, go back to your work and change stuff about set, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a recurring thing. Like Chris has said, you can't, you're not just going to wake up and know everything about your set. You know, you got to, like, you know, take it as it is and roll with the punches and stuff, and then it'll, you know, it'll get a lot better as time progresses, I'm sure. So, there you go, I guess. Um... 
I guess I could also talk about, you know, additional components, but I guess I'd probably save that for another whole new writer's book, and I could talk about the separate things like camera work, props, costume, lighting, you know, editing is another big thing. So, like, so all this stuff I could talk about, and this is whenever it gets kind of diverse, because then you've got Chris talking about, like, novel exclusive things, you know, like, like such a narrative, like, almost different points of view, you know, like, because obviously... Uh, like a, a movie is almost always told by like a narrative standpoint because you're not in the character. You know, it's not as if you're like, looking through their eyes like in a movie where you'd be doing that. You know, or like in a book, sorry, they'd be doing that. So I guess like we could almost go two separate ways. Like different writers' blocks would be like two separate like things going on because at this point, most of the movies and book stuff has been quite pretty like similar. Where like, okay, here's what you do with sets. You know, sets, characters, dialogue, and now it's going to get a bit more. Nitty, like nitty picky whenever it's going to be a, a bit more like okay here's some stuff that's only relevant to films and here's some stuff that's only relevant to books and screenplays and whatnot so yeah. there you go so that's stuff that might be coming up in the future anyway yeah so um interesting um I definitely you know obviously like Pete said there's not a <clears throat> a step by step thing for setting you know we we gave you the different forms of it and the different ways you can go about it and how it's not going to always come naturally just like other parts of uh, of writing. Um, but unlike with characters where we had the types, you know, we don't have... Are there different types of setting? Like, if you th- would you say, or... What do you mean? Like, well, just like we had different types of character, like protagonist, antagonist, like... like um, are there, are exactly. there, are there like... like well, obviously you've got like the, the the trademark. Okay, is it day or is it night? Is it indoors or is it outdoors? You know, like general stuff like that. But it's not nothing that no one's really. How about heard of. other stuff that goes with it, like the atmosphere and the tone and stuff like that that comes. Well, yeah, like I said, that that would go from like the different elements, like camera work and lighting and how. Because like, like a setting is just basically okay. What is there? Like the bare bones. What is there? And then whenever you, and then it's what you do with like the cameras and the lighting and stuff is what makes the tone pretty much. So is it going to be, like, because i got a lot of stuff to talk, because I actually used to do, like, camera work and lighting classes and stuff. So I've got, so, like, so I've got quite a lot of stuff to talk about in regards to, like, how cameras and stuff, how, how, how it, like, brings different effects and whatnot, where something as basic as setting is just kind of, like, it's just, you know, it's just there. But then, obviously, it's kind of important to clarify the different types of set. So it's almost like, um like, the story, whenever it's important to just clarify the basic parts of the story, you know, like, opening, conclusion, and ending. And then to go into more detail later on, you know, it's it's important to know us pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so totally, yeah. That's that's it's good. It's good to be able to have that that different sense of your setting. I definitely think if you're doing like fiction like me, getting into your book and feeling like you're transported there is the best way. Like you know, I'll, I'll close your eyes and try to imagine your setting. Like when I think of my book. I can almost trace a path of where the characters go, and I can visually see where they are. So that's why when you hear writers saying, oh, when when they when a writer sees a movie rendition of their book, they say to themselves, oh, that's not how I envisioned it. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's the director who picked it up and gave their spin on it. So when you think to yourself, oh, this is how I envisioned it, that's not how they envisioned it and such. So... That can that, there can be clashes sometimes with that, and we've seen we talked about I think in the last episode many cases where the movie actually we talked about this in the Matt Guyan interview when like the book like what books you know are bad uh, being rendered from movies you know movies to books and stuff like that 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 whole thing and such so um so definitely interesting so I guess we should wrap it up in terms of setting um, unless P has any more words and um, if not we can get to the conclusion part of our episode oh yeah that's pretty much that's pretty much yeah, a much shorter episode this time around yeah say. definitely shorter and stuff I think in the past we've I don't know if we've either rambled or had uh, or had other um, other elements that we've wanted to incorporate or maybe just had more to say on certain uh, topics uh, next week is a special episode everybody um, next week Ooh, 10 episodes in yes, this is the 10th episode special of the writer's block we've been doing this not for 10 weeks but um, 10 episodes because we took a hiatus during the spring because Pete had exams and stuff and I was graduating so we kind of had to take a hiatus for the events that were going on in our lives but uh, obviously over the summer we've been free and we've had time to actually pump out these episodes quite consistently so episode 10 is coming out next week um and we are basically, the, the premise of episode 10 is a very interesting one. It's basically, we are going to be looking at our works, 
I know we've talked about our works and in pr- practically every single writer's block episode. I've talked about my book, The Orb, many times. Pete's mentioned, you know, the Union series that he has written, some um, some of it, and then in some of his older um, works, like the Park Bench and stuff like that, he that he's done in drama class and school and other stuff like that. Um, we are actually going to be delving in. We will be using the webcam next week, so don't worry if you, if some people are uh, upset, crying face because you didn't get to see our beautiful faces. We'll be back next week. Don't worry. We're going to do it for the 10th ep- episode special, um, where we will be, um, and with XSplit, it's going to be easier where Pete can link to different pages. We can actually see on the screen, and you guys can go along with us and actually kind of critique with us. And what we're going to do is we're going to critique parts of our works using all of the things that we've talked about in the past. So, characters, dialogue, setting, you know, all, you know, protagonist, antagonist, you know, um, you know, the beginning, middle, end of a story, like all of that stuff. We are going to basically take all of the stuff that we've talked about in previous writer's block episodes and apply it in different ways to the works that we've written and basically give you guys a perspective of how we've written our stuff, what we were thinking when we wrote that stuff. And, It'll be a great time to see hiccups. Like, let's say we're reading our work out loud and, you you know, we missed the letter A or we missed an I or something. Like, you'll be able to see where we made mistakes. And you can even compare our mistakes with maybe mistakes that you made. So take our, you know, take our screw-ups as an opportunity to maybe say, oh, maybe I did something like that. Let me go back into my work and see if I can change it or something like that. So it's going to be good. We're going to get to see our own works in more detail, and we're also going to be able to share them with you guys and maybe give you guys some perspective on what you can do to uh, change your stuff as well. And it's going to be um, a great, great episode. Um, I guess Pete and I will talk about, you know, pump-up clips and stuff like that for that, because I might have some different ideas I might want to discuss with him and stuff. Maybe a little different from the format of the previous um, episodes and stuff. But um, nonetheless, uh, pretty good, pretty good. You know, uh, 10 episodes really, you know, we'll, we'll, I think another thing we'll do on our 10th episode is a recap of what we've done in the previous nine. You know, not spend the whole episode talking about what we've done in those episodes, but maybe just generally say, you know, how it started, stuff like that. Like, you know, basically give the brief history of the writer's block up until now. You know, the interview we did and stuff like that. Was the interview a success or not, which we might talk about a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we'll go into all of that, all of that great stuff and stuff. So, um, Pete, if you have any uh, closing words, I'll, I'll close it out if you don't. But, uh, but um, um, I'm pretty much... Set, to be honest. Do you have any updates on... The, usually we do this yeah, again. No, I don't have any updates. I'm no, afraid. no. You know what we totally forgot about? You remember our idea where you would write something in novel form and I would write something in script form? Remember, we totally forgot about that. Sorry? Are we, were you saying something there? Because my, apparently your mic was like cutting out there. It was? Yeah. Oh. No, what I said was, did you... Um, hear the idea about um or do you remember the idea that we had where we were going to write something in the different form like you would do novel oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah well yeah we could do that at some point i guess yeah well we, we <laughs> i posed that in march i believe and <laughs> so it's yeah it's been but we've just been you know we've been busy with other stuff and whatnot even during the summer i know it's hard to believe but you know there's the you know, other stuff that we you know kind of want to just like get done and stuff like that and whatnot so it's uh yeah you know, it's it's uh it's whatever, you know. So um All right, so Pete, if you want to plug yourself or whatever you want to do at the end of this uh, episode. all right, yeah, usual stuff, YouTube slash Pete Oak where I'm uploading Jack videos <laughs> pretty much. Yep. He's, he's, uh, yeah, a lot fashion. of my fans have been interested in that. I know you guys have been messaging me and stuff about that. Yeah, Pete was is uh I don't know Last night, for the first time, he actually uploaded two in, two in a row in a night, which is impressive for you know how slow his internet is. Um, something I posed to him was maybe doing that format for two days during the week, so maybe have four Jack videos, you know, each week, so that if he did that, he might beat the game by you know I don't know I'm not sure, but he'll at least beat the first. I'll get it game. done at some point. I'll get it done by this year, <laughs> probably. This year or this summer? Hmm. This year or this summer? This year, but no, hopefully this summer. Yeah, it'll probably be this summer. Yeah, the first one. I mean, I obviously, it's you're not going to beat all three during the summer. I'd say at least if you can beat the first one by the summer, then that would be, you know, preferred. Suffice. Yeah, so that yeah. would be suffice, and I think my fans would uh, 
would uh, would enjoy that and stuff. I think leaving it off at a cliffhanger once you go back to school and stuff would be <laughs> would be a ball breaker for a lot of people. People would be like, oh, no, what happened? So, so uh, but uh, anyway, you know, my channel, youtube.com slash Lord, you're on it, obviously, if you haven't subscribed or not. Um, I believe I made this a show. Uh, there's also the Lord.com where I put all these episodes up in an organized format. There's a section on the website called the Writer's Block where you can check out our stuff. And uh, all, the, all the episodes are organized. There's a playlist of the writer's block on my channel and Pete's channel. And, um, yep, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. So uh, thank you guys for watching. Episode 9 setting. And uh, we will see you for the 10th episode special next week. Yes. So I'll see you. So we'll see you then, I guess. Yeah, see you then. Woo! Yeah. <laughs>